Good morning. Welcome, everybody, at the second session of this year of the Green Post Corona Talks, organized by the Green European Foundation and Think Tank Oikos. I'm Dirk Holemans, your host of today and co-president of the Green European Foundation. And uh, as every time with these talks, we have people following from all over Europe, which is great. And so I really would suggest if you have a question, put it in the chat, but also write in which city or country you live. Then we have a kind of broad uh, perspective and how many Europeans are participating at this talk. Today, we want to highlight the different approaches green governments have taken at different levels to tackle the COVID-19 crisis. Because as we know, the COVID crisis serves in the first way as a kind of mirror, uh, showing us the difficulties that are already there in our society, the precarities, the inequalities, but it even increases. And the COVID crisis, you can say, hurts, hurts the people that live in precarious situations the most. Think about single parents living in small apartments. Think about uh, school children not having access at home uh, to internet and so finding it very difficult uh, to study. Think about people who lost our job, lost their jobs. And also, as we all have read in the newspapers, the very sad observation that more people than ever have to make use of food banks. So it is clear that the role of uh, public sectors in general and healthcare specifically is crucial in this crisis and also the way <clears throat> governments can support the most vulnerable in our society. To discuss this, we have two very inspiring speakers today. It's really my pleasure and honor to introduce to you Peter de Sutter, Belgian Vice Prime Minister and Minister for the Civil Service and Public Enterprises. And next, it's also my pleasure to introduce you Sonia Sodrovtsov, She's Lyon councillor responsible for international relations, cooperation, international solidarity, and European affairs. Petra, if I may call you so, uh, since the pandemic started, well, first you were a member of the European Parliament, and then you became prime minister, vice uh, prime minister in Belgium, with a government taking place in the midst of the second wave of the COVID crisis in Belgium. And so I think you have quite a good overview of the different governance levels and keeping in mind we are still really in the midst of this crisis and I think nobody can predict when it will really end. Uh, so it would be very good if you could offer us some reflections, the lesson you learned first in being part of the European Parliament and now being a Vice Prime Minister in Belgium. So Petra, I'm very happy to give you the floor. Thank you, Dirk, for inviting me here. It's always a pleasure to uh, to be uh, part of this kind of discussions and to see you again, even in this way. Um, and maybe just to add also, I have a medical background, which yeah. makes it even more um, relevant, I think, to discuss on, uh, sure. on this kind of pandemic and health uh, issues. Um, so, yeah, I would I would say that as far as we are now, because we're not yet out of the crisis, of course, um, uh, we have, I think, learned or we have to learn five lessons from this crisis in uh, regards to the healthcare uh, healthcare systems. Um, we, we know that the pandemic, uh, if I may say, has uh, has seen health systems across Europe uh, subjected to to a uh, overwhelming rise in the number of patients needing treatment, of course, being admitted to hospitals, dying, sadly. And this has been unprecedented. We were not prepared for this. That, that's clear. Um, it also has led so far to increased government spending on healthcare and a lot of creativity of the healthcare system itself to create additional capacity. We all remember it's definitely in the first wave, mainly uh, what was needed to have more ICU beds uh, than uh, available in most of the, the hospitals, um, even building additional facilities and even asking the army to intervene and so on. I mean, we remember the, the first wave, of course. Um, of course, this came actually, I would say, hot on the heels of decades of austerity uh, policies in Europe and elsewhere in the world. Um, and because of these decades of austerity, many countries were not prepared and, and were found themselves, they found themselves at a disadvantage. And we as green politicians, we've been pointing out the lack of public investment in healthcare 
and of course the evolution towards commercialization of our health services uh, for years, I would say for decades as well. Um, yes, the EU has uh, played a role in this too, because we know that if we look at the European semester, I guess most of you will know what that means in the negotiations with the member states, the EU has asked to privatize healthcare systems and reduce health expenditure, public expenditure, over 60 times in the past uh, years. So this was clearly not a priority also at the EU level. And this liberalization, I would say, and focus, one-sided focus on cost efficiency in healthcare systems has have thus uh, left us with very little uh, surplus capacity, buffer capacity, I would say, for crisis management. Um, in Belgium, for instance, and we didn't, we were not the worst. I must say, there were other countries that that were worse. But uh, we have ha we have seen staff uh, shortages in nursing homes, for instance, for the elderly uh, since many years. And of course, nursing homes have been hit particularly hard by the co Corona crisis, and the death toll in these uh, settings has been um, particularly uh, high. Now, if this crisis has shown us one thing, then it is that a strong public health system with strong qualified workforce is crucially important if we want resilient public health care, a resilient society and a resilient economy for that matter. And Europe and the member states need to invest much more in health, in health systems and in healthcare staff. I would say that would be the first uh, lesson to take from this crisis so far. The second lesson is that, uh, yes, we were not prepared. So crisis management, crisis preparedness needs to be uh, strengthened. And we've seen that um, even if there were earlier warnings for this pandemic to come, um, we we didn't see them and we didn't act uh, along along the lines uh, to to be aware of or to be prepared for that. Um, maybe as green politicians, we can of course address the issue of the fact that uh, COVID, in in essence, is of course a zoonotic disease, a, a disease that jumps from animals to to the human population, uh, which we have seen in the past and. Which has to uh, to be sought in in a troubled relationship with ecosystems and habitats, wildlife habitats. Of course, we've seen HIV/AIDS, we've seen Ebola as previous examples, but never, of course, at this uh, scale. Experts already are warning that uh, after COVID-19, there will be other pandemics uh, emerging in the future, um, as long as and for sure, if we continue to destroy the uh, wildlife wildlife habitat um, in in uh, in in the world. For us as, as Green parties, it, it will become increasingly urgent, I would say, that we have governments and European institutions understand the delicate balance between uh, people and planet and wildlife for that matter. The EU uh, committed, of course, uh, now to protect biodiversity in 30% of all ecosystems by 2030, and that commitment needs to be backed up uh, by investment and, and action. Um, links between biodiversity loss and the origins of the present crisis, and also between uh, air pollution and vulnerability uh, to COVID-19 show that the issues of environment and health simply cannot be separated. And as Greens, we've known that for many, many years, of course. A second, uh, I would say, area where we're not, we were not prepared at all is that um, that of the protective materials, uh, what, what is called PPE, personal protective equipment. We in Belgium, for instance, just before the, the, the pandemic uh, 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 arise, uh, has arisen, I would say, we destroyed massive stocks of uh, masks um, and we did not replenish them. Um, although we had a pandem pandemic plan that, that urged us to do so, it simply didn't happen. We had shortage, shortages in protective clothing, um, which was especially dangerous in nursing homes during the first wave and was the reason for a lot of infections and uh, and um, and deaths, unfortunately. Um, we may have believed that the global markets would not fail us on this, uh, but we were wrong. Uh, they did fail us and they were unable to provide enough protective equipment uh, to meet the global pandemic. Uh, 
And what this has exposed is that European countries are too dependent on global supply chains. This is something that has to do with the globalization that we've seen for, for decades as well. So one of the lessons to take there is maybe think about uh, local production for critical and essential goods and services. This is something I think the EU is really considering now. Um, the third lesson I would say is that uh, if we look from a European perspective, that European governance really matters. If we want to convince citizens and um, uh, tell them that the EU is important, we must prioritize those issues that Europeans really care about. And this is health and well-being. And the EU must go beyond recommendations and take binding action. Um, the agency, for instance, European Center for Disease uh, Prevention and Control um, has a mandate for crisis management and preparedness, but it should be strengthened and given uh, greater power to coordinate possible border closure or provide emergency stocks of medicines and equipment. We've seen that all these things happened in the first wave in a very uncoordinated and chaotic way, which led to even more problems afterwards. And only later, the, e the European Commission has managed uh, to, to get some, some coordination and recommendations to the member states. Um, the fourth lesson is that we need to rethink how we produce and market pharmaceuticals. This is something that really enters the debate today with the vaccines, of course. The power of the pharmaceutical industry is, uh, is tremendous. Firms not only negotiate prices to their advantage, but also focus on producing the most profitable drugs. They're not so much interested in orphan drugs or low-cost drugs. So I think this is an opportunity to really consider a paradigm shift um, and the new paradigm in drug development or vaccine development should probably be or it's a model to be examined, should be delinking. And delinking means that we disconnect the costs of research and development from the price, I would say the marketing of the end product. The cost and the risks of research and development could be remuner remunerated directly, encouraging innovation, which means that it could respond to a greater um, uh, to, to patient needs to a greater extent, um, not where the highest profits can be found. Uh, now it is the companies themselves that choose which development, which research they will uh, have, and and of course they will direct. Uh, their research to products that in the end will be more profitable and it will not start from what society really needs, what our patient needs, and that is probably a public decision to be uh, taken. So you could think of a system where the production, the second step of medicines could then, um, you know, be, be the responsibility of generic firms uh, where market mechanisms may play a role, but are delinked from the development of new drugs. That would be the decision of public uh, authorities. Um, because now, sometimes or often, pharmaceutical companies actually collect their money twice. They pick up public funds for R&D and they work together with your insurance uh, systems. Delinking would it make easier to set conditions for the pharmaceutical companies? The government could require open source uh, working or insist that companies make their technologies available free to economically poorer countries, which is a bit of the discussion that we have now with the, the vaccines. Um, it is important uh, that we do not forget that other parts of the world, especially uh, in the pandemic, um, do not have easily access to uh, drugs and to vaccines now. And for this pandemic, uh, you've heard uh, the slogan before, no country will be safe until every country is uh, safe. So the EU, out of solidarity, but even out of interest uh, for themselves, and other member states should invest more in the in the COVAX uh, program that probably most of you will know, which has been uh, set up to provide economically poorer countries with free vaccines. But even pro COVAX will not be sufficient to get us there. My, my personal opinion is that we have to reconsider as well the existing rules around patents 
uh, intellectual property and industrial secrets, and they should be lifted if it is really necessary in in times of crisis as the current one. Um, you know probably of the, the TRIPS agreement. Well, you can have a waiver to that agreement. Um, this is perfectly legal and NGOs and certain countries like South Africa and India have been uh, asking for that. A waiver that would allow certain countries uh, freer access to the intellectual property uh, of the production for the production of drugs or vaccines, as in this case. Um, and this is simply in the interest of world health, of global health, which is also our own interest, by the way. And then the last lesson um, to close is that misery loves company. Um, and Dirk, you, you have already touched upon it in, in your introduction. This crisis is not the, the, the great equalizer. In, on the contrary, it has really led to inequalities being much more visible than before. And a polarization that we've never seen before. Um, some of the issues you have mentioned, like poverty and so on, but I, was, I would also add mental health issues, I would add child abuse, I would add, health, uh, sorry, add uh, domestic uh, violence, gender-based violence. We just had International Women's Day to, uh, yesterday. As you know, this, uh, this is a, a great subject, uh, an important subject to, uh, to consider seriously as well. Um, we also know that um, COVID in itself will lead to um, some long-term health consequences um, like fatigue, chronic cough and some other symptoms that, uh, that are not being investigated at all right now. And the WHO has said that this could even happen in people with uh, mild uh, disease. So we'll have to prepare our healthcare systems to deal with a, a whole lot of patients that have what you could call some kind of post-COVID syndrome, um, which will need some uh, multidisciplinary uh, approach. And, and we are nowhere uh, today in the care for these, uh, these people. Um, another issue that I think is important to mention is that because of the COVID crisis and the, the burden on the hospitals, a lot of the non-COVID care has been postponed. We know that in Belgium in 2020, 40% fewer cancer diagnoses have been made than the year before. That means people with cancer that have remained undiagnosed and that will be diagnosed in a later stage, which means a stage where <clears throat> probably, <coughs> sorry, the risks for their health will be more important and the mortality will rise. So, because cancer uh, needs to be diagnosed in the earliest possible stage, of course. So, we need to take a broader view of healthcare issues also uh, in this pandemic. And the OECD has stated that whilst the spotlight has largely fallen on hospitals, we also have to look at primary health care and mental health services because they're also in a critical stage in times of crisis and uh, we have to foster longer term resilience. So, and then I will end with that. As Greens, we always stress the need for a true health in all policies approach. We can't repeat it enough. One that takes into account the consequence of pu public pub uh, policy on healthcare systems, health determinants, inequalities and well-being. And not only focusing on health, but also on food, on agriculture, on trade, on employment. They all affect our health and we have to use that health in all policies approach in all our policy decisions because Prevention, as it has been said so many times, is key. Prevention benefits also the citizens and the national budgets, of course, uh, in healthcare expenditure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, for this very, uh, in a concise way, uh, giving talking about these five lessons. I, I was really uh, very informative. Like, I didn't know that the EU 60 times asked national governments to privatize parts of their health system. It's really looking back crazy. Uh, I also think it's very important that you touched upon the intellectual property rights, because uh, if there would be no patent or kind of weaver, we could have many factories in many countries now producing sufficient vaccines. So it's, I think it's really a key message. And also, of course, in the end, uh, emphasizing that health is a holistic issue that we have to talk about uh, prevention, about the role of food, housing, I think is indeed uh, 
it's very important as Greens to always think about this. So many thanks for really in a short time giving us a lot of uh, insights. And so now I'm very happy to give the floor to Sonia, who is, as I said, council in Lyon. Uh, a city in France, and so it's very interesting to now have a view from the city level. And of course, uh, Sonia, you can inform us not only about the situation in Lyon, but also in France, and, and maybe also we are, of course, a bit curious about this uh, the, the formula for this magic success in the local elections the Greens did. So, yeah, we are very uh, eager to listen to you. We're thanking you to give me the opportunity to, to talk to you today, to take the floor, to share the floor with Petra. Uh, it's a great opportunity to highlight what has been done here in Lyon uh, during this um, difficult time. So, as you said, we were recently elected. Uh, we were elected at the very end of June. So we've been working for the past six to eight months and, and working during, during a pandemic. Um, the situation here in Lyon is, I would say, preoccupying, but maybe not the most alarming situation in France. Uh, we've been talking a lot recently in the media about Dunkirk or Nice. Uh, Dunkirk, for instance, has an incidence rate that was above 1,000 cases last week, uh, which is really high because anything above 50 uh, must be monitored. Here in, in Lyon, we are uh, within national average. We are around 240. So like I said, preoccupying, but not the most alarming one. What is preoccupying is probably the fact that 50% of the positive cases that we get here are variants of the original virus, most of them being what we call the British variant, which is way more contagious than we were than the one we were used to. And also, the fact that the availability of the intensive care units um, is very low. In Lyon, 95% of them are completely full, half of them by COVID patients, meaning that we don't have much leeway to take care of potential future, future patients. And uh, like Petra said, uh, I, I guess <laughs> the government heard the, the, the call from the European Union because between the first lockdown and now, the, the availability of the intensive care units, intensive care units have been reduced. So we have left, less and less room to actually accommodate um, COVID patients. Uh, we've started vaccination like the rest of the country. It's going well, but at a not so speedy pace. Uh, we are able to vaccinate in one of the major vaccination center. I will talk about it maybe later. Um, between 5,000 and 7,000 people each week. And then we have to deal with the day-to-day -day situation, which is not a lockdown. We are not under lockdown at the moment, but we have a curfew. We have a curfew. We have to be home by, by 6 if we're not working remotely. And most people are encouraged to work remotely, but it's, uh, it's not as followed as it was during the first lockdown, I would say. So the, the perspective and how we try to work from Lyon is obviously a very local perspective. Uh, we have some prerogatives, but not as much as a national government. So we're trying to maybe complete or improve some of the national solution that has been offered by, by the state. Uh, some of the things that we've tried to implement, implement, I will list a few, was first of all, when we first arrived, was to set up testing centers. Uh, we've worked with the regional health agency and the hospitals of Lyon to, to set up a lot of testing centers, mainly throughout the city and mainly near um, underground station entrances to be able to get as many people tested as possible. And that was more of a urgency situation kind of thing. And then we moved on to work with the hospitals. So there are three major testing testing centers throughout the city within hospitals, and then one major testing center, which was set up within the stadium. Um, the stadium opened in September 24th, and between September 24th and December 9th, we have tested uh, 42,000 people, mainly from the area. I would say 50% of them were from the city of Lyon, and then 40% were from the Greater Lyon area, and then we had 10% of people coming completely out of, uh, out of the area, out of the region, uh, mainly during the holiday, the fall holiday. A lot of people were passing through, 
and they knew there was this stadium that was open where you could be tested um, without any appointment for free and that you would get your results by mail within 24 hours. So that was a great setup and uh, we were praised, including by the national government, which we don't really always share the same ideas for being so reactive and offering uh, complementary solutions to what was happening um, in France. Um, then now we're moving on from testing centers to opening vaccination centers, because that really is the crux of the situation. We have to get as many people as vaccinated. So the vaccination centers have been open also within hospitals, and we have divided the stadium between now a testing center and a vaccination center. We're vaccinating anyone above 75 years of age, um, anyone above 50 who has one or two comorbidities, and of course, anyone within the health, health care system or working in care, especially if they work with uh, the elderly or anyone who's um, more likely to get sick than the rest of the population. So it, it's definitely not as speedy as we would like, like it to be. I think Petra probably put the finger on some of the reasons. Uh, it's not going as, uh, as fast as we, as we would like to, but uh, we're doing our share as a city to make sure that the vaccination is moving on. And then we have other healthcare measures we've been implementing to, like I say, complete and or improve uh, national solutions. We've, we've worked a lot as a city on mental health care issues, which is, um, I guess we're not Greens, both of us, uh, for no reasons. Uh, we, we've truly um, understood that that was one of the biggest issues we had to face. A lot of people um, are struggling with the situation, uh, the several lockdowns, the fear of having a third one, the lack of revenues for many, and the fact that we don't really get to enjoy life as we used to um, with the absence of bars, restaurants, cultural venues, it's really taking a, a toll on all of us. And we have to take care of those who are struggling the most. So we have set up a helpline, which is open 20, 27 days a week, uh, seven days a week, 27 days a week, which is open seven days a week. And we've also set up um, listening points throughout the city to make sure that those who were not maybe, who wouldn't have the, the will or the envy to call will also be able to talk about their fears and how they were, they were coping with the situation. And we open those listening points throughout the cities, but more of them within the not so well off neighborhoods because we thought that this had to be a priority for us. And we also worked quite a lot on dissemination of information, awareness raising about some of the gesture you should do or avoid so as to prevent the spread of the disease and also information just about where we are in the situation altogether uh, where we're heading, uh, what are the possibilities where we might be heading. I think also what is taking a toll on us is the uncertainty of what's going to happen to us. So as a, as a city, as a maybe small group, local group, we try to be supportive of the population in that way to make sure that information, including national information, but also local information was widely available. We've worked as well on backing economic actors and we focused on some of the local, maybe more smaller businesses. We made sure that they were able to remain open with adapt, adapted maybe procedure. And we've also developed an app. We relaunched an app actually that was um, created during the first lockdown where you could actually list and geocalize uh, businesses that are locally owned, that offer locally maybe produce that offer locally, yeah, locally produced food or things or whatever to support our next door neighbor, basically. And unlike the first, the first lockdown, we made sure that uh, this new majority, that we as Greens, we would keep the markets, the open air markets opened uh, during the first lockdown. They were closed, and the only way you could do your grocery shopping was to go to supermarkets. 
Now we know that it's better if we have to be more than six people in one area to be outside rather than all together in one room. So we made sure they remained open uh, with the adapted procedure. And we've also opened some of the spots within the open air markets to restaurants, uh, caterers, anything related to food services to give them a chance to sell their, their food, their produce, and to have some sort of revenue but also to keep the relationship between um, their customers and themselves alive. Um, I know maybe I'm talking too much about food, but it's quite important to us in France, but also in Lyon. Uh, Lyon is the capital of French gastronomy. So um, not being able to have that relationship and to have that opportunity and to see everything basically close is very hard for us um, economically, but also socially. So that was one of the, one of the things we worked on. Of course, uh, we also try to facilitate solidarity initiatives. I think it's very important that we take care of each other and that we facilitate those who are interested in taking care of others. So when the second lockdown started at the very end of October, we as a city collected and distributed all the perishable goods that we saved from closing restaurants and caterers and other food services. And everything was distributed to the most in need, to those most in need. And then we again worked on apps and also ways of putting people uh, in touch. So individuals, one app was putting individuals in touch, those who had time and the will and the energy to help and those who needed help. And also we reference all the initiatives that were maybe um, supported by institutions like the city or the greater Lyon area or the region uh, by associations, our media association, which are helping during this situation and also some, some firms. And, and everyone was able and still able to contribute, contribute in one way or another to facing, tackling the situation together. And then, um, I think one of the things I would like to talk about also was the fact that this um, situation was also a struggle for a lot of us because we were depending on decisions made by others and uh, we couldn't really, couldn't really, I don't know, uh, we were not the actors anymore of our life and we were suffering the situation and we were not taking part in the solutions. We could help, but we were not suggesting solutions. So we as a city, we, we took this decision to create um, a local advisory council. So it's called the Conseil Consultatif COVID. It's a new governance institution uh, and a way to give back uh, power to the citizens and to give them the ability and the opportunity to provide and suggest solutions. So it's made up of 300 people uh, which represent the diversity of the city of Lyon. They met regularly uh, each month, actually. It was created in December, so it has met three times so far in December, January and February. And also every month they are all surveyed, so they get to work and be consulted on different issues. When they formally met, they never met all together because 300 people, that would be, <laughs> according to national guidelines, that would be right. They met, they meet by a group of 30 people and never the same. So uh, each people we, will have the opportunity at some point to sit within the council. And when they are not sitting within the council, they are at least taking part in the survey. The surveys, uh, they've been uh, tackling issues such as the lockdowns and other preventing me preventive measures that were collectively taken to prevent the spread of the virus, especially during the, the end of the year celebrations, but that was in December. And then in January, they worked on the potential reopening of cultural venues, which was a great way to actually draw out solutions which were then suggested to the national government and now there is a discussion going on between the cities and the national government about potentially reopening cultural venues and adapting um, their reopening because a lot of people don't understand why we are able to go to supermarkets which are 
pretty big and to take public transportation, but we're not able to go to the movies or to the theater with a small like amount of people around us. Okay, Sonia, uh, allow me to uh, yes. intervene here. Uh, thank you very much. It's clear that you are very uh, doing great things in here, and, and also this complementarity between uh, what um, Petra said, the national government can do, and then also these these things. I, I really appreciated your listening points you installed in the city. I think it's a great initiative. Also, uh, the food. So you remind us why it's always nice to come to your city. Uh, but interesting to how you invest in trying to maintain the relationships with food producers. And I think also crucial, and we see that in many cities, is the support. Uh, local government gives to uh, solidarity initiatives of citizens this bottom-up approach and I think this is also key for I would call it a uh, green policies is really to work together with the citizens not this classical top-down way of working um, so many thanks and we we'll, I will come back to you with a few questions but we already have one question from the public uh, for Petra and so there's someone asking could we make pharmaceutical products uh, public goods so that governments do not have to bargain with private companies for products they funded to develop. Yes, well, um, when I um, I started, um, I, I talked about the concept of de-linking, which is actually partially uh, that concept. That means that the public uh, authorities decide which new drugs we need to uh, develop and research. And once they are there, we could ask companies to produce them. Um, there is a lot of discussion whether the, the, the government should also produce drugs. Um, that would be a, a further step. It's not impossible, of course, but the, the concept of delinking both is interesting because then you uncouple also the influence that exists between the pharmaceutical industry and the universities which are very, very intertwined and sometimes leading to conflicts of interest and some other problems. So you could interfere there as the public authority, but then let the production over to the market, as I said, to companies. Now, there is a way, of course, to go a step further. And in crisis times, like we have now, the TRIPS agreements, which regulate world trade and intellectual property, um, they provide in a waiver which is possible for drugs to be produced in countries that do not own the intellectual property. And the first application was for HIV AIDS a medication in, uh, for instance, South Africa years ago, where they could produce their own um, drugs from the patents that were out there uh, at a cost uh, that they could afford, because of course these drugs were much too expensive for them. So there is a lot of pressure now international, internationally to do the same with the vaccines, make it open, available and then other uh, producers like in India we have a lot of pharmaceutical companies be, that are able to produce the vaccines but they don't have the formula they don't have the patent so if you open that up um, and have a waiver to the TRIPS agreement um, you could even go to compulsory licensing where authorities decide that the patent is lifted and they give it to other producers to do this in view of their own national public health uh, interests so there is systems that allow that but as you understand uh, countries member states in the west in the eu very interlinked with the pharmaceutical industry of course they're very hesitant to go for this kind of mechanisms because they would see it as an attack against the pharmaceutical uh, you know industry as a whole so it's a very delicate thing but i fully agree with uh, with the, the the question that uh, drugs maybe should be seen much more as public goods which are financed by the public um, and then, you know, paid by the public a second time, then this is the case. This is not a normal market situation uh, as, you, as you could see it for other goods. So that point definitely is taken. Thank you. And of course, it relates to the work of Matsukato about who creates the wealth in our society. And uh, after Petra, I have to apologize not informing the public that you're a gynecologist and also a former professor in reproductive medicine. So you really are an expert also in the field of medicine and how universities work inside and together with companies. So uh, sorry for not mentioning that in the beginning. Um, 
Right. Um, and so now I want to move to what I would say a bit more political questions. Uh, uh, I was already starting to um, ask this question, Petra. Greens have entered government in Belgium. There are many parties in the government. So how can Greens uh, make a difference uh, in government, governments in crisis? A uh, simple question, I think no easy answer, but I have to ask it. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a simple question, but it's very complex because we started in October. So just on the eve of the second wave. So the first thing that we had to do is to take very drastic measures. Um, we couldn't prevent the second wave, but then we put in place uh, a whole lot of measures that after the second wave kept us on a plateau. So we did not have a third wave so far in Belgium. And let's touch wood that this will not happen. Uh, but you, you enter in a whole discussion about the democratic legitimacy of the, the measures you take, if, you, if it's constitutional and so on. So it's a whole debate that we're involved uh, in. I remember when we installed the curfew, we were very much uh, against this, but in the government with seven parties, you have to find a consensus. It's not majority minority, it's really consensus and give and take. So we understood that there was a big will to install the curfew as it was in different countries. Now we're talking about lifting it again. We are you know, the first in row to say, okay, this is the, the proportionality of such a measure. We have, uh, you know, uh, come to the end of it. If, if we will reopen society within, let's say, one or two months, which is on the table, if the, 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 the corona data uh, allow it, of course. But uh, then you hear that some parties say, well, we should uh, stay with the curfew uh, because it's easier for the police to control people. And that is for me, a very bad argument. So we will have that debate and we'll have a heavy fight on that very soon in the government. Um, but maybe besides the, the COVID, um, I would say having Greens in a government is, a, is extremely important, of course, to get us closer to the, the green transition that we have uh, been working for for uh, many, many years. This is an ambition of the of the European Commission, as you know, the Green Deal. And now with the recovery, you know that uh, Europe is giving quite uh, a lot of money to the member states um, to, to recover from the crisis and to rebuild industries, economies and so on. We have pushed in the federal government of Belgium for more than 50% of all the projects to be what is called climate target targeted because uh, the European Commission asks for 37% we went to above 50% mainly in mobility and in energy which are domains that are in our portfolios so that's uh, that's a good thing but uh, we have really pushed much further than what uh, really was on the table and our coalition partners um, let us do that why well we are with five uh, ministers in the current government which is exactly uh, 25% and we have quite some weight specifically because we have all these green domains of climate, green deal, energy and mobility uh, mainly. So these are the, 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 the portfolios where we really weight much more than in any uh, government before us. Even the prime minister, who's not a green, who's a liberal, he said that the government agreement that we made was the greenest, the, the greenest agreement uh, in Belgian history. And I think this uh, this is true. Of course, we'll have to uh, push to implement it and to see the results of it. But so far, like in the recovery, the RRF uh, dis the discussions, for so the relance, as we call it as well, we've really uh, pushed a lot and, and put our um, our issues on the table. I can give many other uh, um, examples of social policies, also of um, asylum, migration, where we really are a, a motor, a, a driving force in the negotiations within the government uh, to, to push the agenda in the good direction. Um, it takes time and since it is a consensual process where there is a lot of negotiations, um, it may be less visible than maybe our voters would want to see and we are not able to accomplish the whole of our program. Um, but uh, so far, after five, six months, uh, I would say it's really going into a, a good direction. Even more, we are also kind of a, a buffer. I don't know if, I, if that's the right word, word, but economically, you usually have the liberals and the socialists and they fight all the time. 
and we can take positions which are somewhere you know in, in the middle or above or it's interesting to have a dynamic with uh, with more than than these two uh, parties uh, on on that single axe of course you have the christian democrats as well and this is the four groups and that's why the coalition is called vivaldi but the christian democrats they always agree with with everybody so th th they're not really a force in the debate they are following and sometimes but we are an interesting player that can move decisions in one or another direction dependent on the subject so i think the dynamics are very promising okay thank you, thank you. for this uh, elaboration and i would say it's uh, maybe better to be on top than being in the middle of two other parties <laughs> But you mentioned the curfew, which indeed is, is a, a now a kind of central debate also in the parliament. And so, Sonia, uh, in France, you also have experience with a very strict curfew. So I can imagine there are also quite some debates. So I'm curious what your stance is on the curfew. Um, I wouldn't say the curfew is very strict <laughs> because um, I, I work often past 6 p.m. and when I go outside and go back home, I can see there are a lot of people outside. So I think there's a lot of fatigue from everyone in France about uh, the pandemic, the situation, and also the measures taken by the government. So what we're trying to do is to be constructive. Like I said, we're not, we don't always agree with what's, what the, the decision taken by the national government. And we make sure that they know, but we're also, like I said earlier, trying to be constructive, to offer a solution, and not to just um, complain and uh, criticize what is being done by the national government who doesn't share our values or our ideas, but to also have ideas of our own. And um, to me, the curfew, I wouldn't really know what to say, honestly, because um, I'm not sure it's the best way to make sure people do not cross each other. Like I said, we're working on maybe reopening cultural values, venues and having uh, theaters and cinemas open just like supermarkets are opened. And uh, maybe it's more important to work on uh, people's movement and flu and to make sure that we, not, we do not uh, cross too many people and that the virus doesn't spread as easily as it could. But is the curfew the right answer? Uh, we've been under the curfew for more than, for a lot of weeks. I can't remember the last time it was debated. And that's one of the things maybe as Greens we would like to see is debates, debates again, uh, around the issues, around the, the several measures that are being taken by the government. Um, to debate with the government as a city, but also to have that debate uh, among us as citizens and that the government is not doing at the moment. They're just taking decisions and we have to deal with it. Okay. okay. Um, one question I really also want to ask uh, to Petra is, uh, we are all, most of us, working a lot at, ho at home, at teleworking, which has now become the norm. And, and on the one hand, you can say it has advantages. So you can manage your life a bit more flexible, but on the other hand, uh, it can also have bad effects on your work, work life balance, working much more hours without taking notice of that. And so, uh, Peter, you're Minister for Civil Service and Public Enterprises. And so I'm interested to hear what kind of policies uh, have been implemented to support workers working at home? And also, do you see differences between the public sector and the private sector? And also, imagine uh, the COVID crisis is over. I think there will be a new situation. So how do you look at this? Yes, thank you, Dirk, because this is indeed one of my competences and I'm working on that, um, I would say, almost daily uh, telework, which was seen before the crisis as something, yes, we let's think about it, but a lot of... Uh, uh, people in leading positions did not trust it too much. They did not trust uh, too much people working from home. Are they really working or doing other things and so on? I think we have passed that uh, attitude completely because now we are in compulsory teleworking mode. That means everybody that can telework must 
telework, except if uh, if you can't or there's an exception. So in the public uh, service, in the civil service, we have introduced teleworking um, since now, uh, yeah, quite some months, and uh, we are monitoring uh, the adherence, the cohesion, I would say, to to that measure, and it's about 85 percent. Now there are exceptions, uh, you know, a warden in a prison cannot telework, obviously, so there will be exceptions, but 85 percent is not too bad. In the private sector, um, it tends to be lower. Um, we know that. And there is uh, social inspectors that are checking on that. Uh, some uh, enterprises publicly even say we are tired of it. It doesn't work. It decreases our efficacy. And uh, there's a lot of disadvantages. We need to stop this. I think in the public service, there is also a, a lot more social control. I mean, in a department, if, let's say, um, uh, somebody in charge decides that uh, everybody has to come to the office, it will be known immediately uh, everywhere and there will be a lot of reactions. So I think the adherence is much higher there. Now, uh, I would say that you cannot install telework just like that. You have to make some um, framework for it. And in, in the future, Telework is going to stay in a kind of a hybrid model. We will probably, and this is also in agreement of the government, install it for two days a week on average for civil servants. This is also what they ask. It's not something that we are imposing. This is something that lives on the floor. The people would like that um, balance, two days at home and then three days in the office, for instance. So there is a, a support for that. Well, you need some um, some costs uh, uh, that need to be compensated, some remuneration for that, because you are, of course, using electricity, heating, internet from home. You need ergonomic ergonomic material. Uh, if you work from home, you can't sit on a kitchen chair uh, all the time. Um, some people need. Uh, specific or have specific needs. Uh, so for people with a handicap, we have already um, uh, found funds to adapt their uh, workstations at home to, to the, the way that they would work in the office. Um, there's a whole uh, lot of things that you have to think about. We are even offering training to people in charge uh, how to, um, I would say, coach a team from home, how are you going to do that? This, these are asks for new skills, new uh, competences also in uh, people that are in charge of, of the teams uh, and in management positions. Um, we are working on burnout prevention tools. This is an important one because telework, specifically now when it is compulsory, uh, leads to a, a dangerous situation where there is no line between work and and. Uh, life, the work-life balance can be fully disturbed. We're working on our smartphones every time we see the mails coming also in the weekends. And this is a, a ingredient for burnout. So we need to make sure that there is something like a right to disconnect, to go offline, and that this is respected also by uh, the team leaders uh, and also by uh, people themselves. We need to protect them against sometimes the, the, the wish to continue working all the time, which is a danger uh, towards burnout. So we are putting in place that framework and for the future, we will you know, make legislation that, uh, that um, uh, put, yeah, make, implements that framework uh, in, the, in the civil service, in the public function, uh, in private functions as well. But that, there it will be more a negotiation, of course, between the, the, the enterprise you work for and you as a worker. Um, also, the compensation for telework, the conditions, the right to disconnect, we will want really to, to write that in law because it should be applied not only in public, also in private. And I know also at the European level, I've been working before in the parliament on the right to disconnect. This is something that is a concept that people are thinking, why, why do we need that? But if you think further, yes, we need it. We need to protect people against themselves sometimes, both in public and private, of course. Great, thank you. Uh, time is moving fast, so uh, I think there is time for one last, uh, I would say not question, but kind of suggestion uh, somebody made from the public, and I, I would really be happy to hear a short reaction of both of you. So there's a reaction, uh, women are often overlooked when it comes to the economic impact of COVID-19. As countries respond to the biggest challenges of our generation, they should view women as builders of a stronger, more equitable post-COVID world. Women should be put first. 
So maybe Sonia, um, yeah, as a Greens politician. Yeah, <laughs> young Green politician, both in age and in experience, I would say. Um, I think women are overlooked, not just when it comes to the economic impact of COVID-19. Um, we're often undervalued and, and not heard, or our opinions are not valued. So uh, yesterday was uh, International Women's Day, or as we call it in France, the, the day for the advancement of rights of women, which is, I think, better way to put it. Um, there's still a lot to do, and uh, I'd say that we as Greens, at least in France, I think we're taking our part as well in that. I, I, I joined the, the Greens, the French Greens, because to me it was the only party in France which was really feminist, which really had the value of women at heart, and which really was hearing what we had to say and taking it into consideration, and not just putting women because it was pretty on the picture, or young people because it, it was looking also pretty on the picture, but they actually value uh, collective intelligence and working all together as a group and not just uh, putting forward individuals and uh, which are usually white, male and above 50 in other political parties. So um, yeah, I don't know if <laughs> women should be put first, but they should definitely not be over, over, overlooked or in the value, that's for sure. Thank you very much for this, uh, I think, very uh, relevant uh, observation. So, Petra, you have the last word. <laughs> well, um, yes, just to add a few things to what Sonia said, which I uh, fully agree with, of course. Uh, I think the Green Party is the most feminist party there is, uh, clearly. Um, I think if we look at the care sector in this crisis, and we have been applauding them, they were the heroes of the crisis uh, taking care of, uh, of us. You should know that uh, 90 percent, uh, 90%, actually 83 for the for the nurses and and, and 93 for the aide soignant. I don't know in English uh, the, the caring staff in uh, in hospitals, but also in nursing homes and so on, are women, of course. So they are the ones that are the real heroes of the crisis. They are women that also had families that were there at the risk of their own health. Now they're vaccinated, okay, but uh, until recently, they were standing in the front line. If we say the people in the care sector, we should thank them. Most of them um, are the, the people that, that are at the beds of the patients and they are women again. And we can talk about the, the you know, uh, care that women again took during this crisis for the family, for the children, um, the, the, all the stereotypes, all the inequalities that, uh, that came up again that were reinforced by this crisis and that, uh, well, we discussed indeed uh, also yesterday on International Women's Day. Um, I think it's, it's an important subject to to remind us of and to get that gender mainstreaming um, approach in all our policies, um, definitely in crisis, but let's not forget it in the post-COVID times as well, once we have again to make uh, political decisions for the future. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much for this concise hour and, and concise answer. I, and this webinar really went one hour and it's over, so this this means it were very interesting uh, contributions. I want to thank you both. And I think uh, for me, it's clear that uh, if you talk about green values and, and what should green policies be about, it's I think really putting care, the value of care in the center of all policies and how also how we look at the world and how we look at each other. And I think really, if we could build a new world centered around the concept and value of care, we really are, are building a better post-corona world. So many thanks for your contribution. I know you are very busy people, so uh, I would say um, let's see you again in better times, maybe in Lyon. That would be lovely. So bye, everybody. Thank you, Dirk. Always a pleasure. Bye-bye.